small business owner. And that person probably didn't want their next, you know, the next generation to go into it. And, and it's interesting because now it's, it's totally different. Now entrepreneurship, it's still a means of survival for so many people, but it, it's more than that. It's, it's a way to self-actualize. It's a way to be creative. And um, someone mentioned to me today, uh, some of the works at Shopify, Lindsey Craig mentioned this Andy Warhol quote that in the future, I think it's Andy Warhol, uh, everyone's going to be famous for 15 minutes. And I thought about it sort of in the context of entrepreneurship that if every single person uh, commercialized their hobby, if every single person, whatever their gift was, maybe it's they make beautiful blankets for their children, or maybe someone makes the greatest, you know, soup. Uh, imagine everyone took that thing that they make that is special and unique and shared it with the world of entrepreneurship. Um, what if in the future everyone would be an entrepreneur? What would that look like? And I think that would be a world of a lot of creativity, a lot of great passion, a lot of people doing their life's work rather than sort of having this job. And it's interesting to see how that, 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 that connotation of entrepreneurship and what that means has changed from generation to generation. That concept of having somebody in your family who sort of influenced that, uh, I think is so important. And, you know, we talk a lot about like the lemonade stand, which is something I hope isn't sort of going away in this pandemic era. Uh, but are you seeing people sort of doing that uh, now like as an intergenerational thing where people are working with their, you know, their older family members to, to start shops or working even with their kids to start shops? Uh, and also, like, what do you think it is that somebody instills in their children that makes them say, like, I could be this entrepreneur? And, you know, if somebody out there is trying to think of, you know, I'm about to have a kid in May and I'm trying to think like, well, what am I going to teach her to make her want to like, you know, make this world more malleable than it appears to make it her own. You know, what do you, what, what do you find uh, that can be taught to kids that help them drive this idea of the company that they can take the world on as their own? Toby and I have this uh, mutual friend, his name is John Hope Ryan. He's an amazing man and he's, uh, he created Operation Hope and we're doing this, we're, we're creating a program together with John to create 1 million black businesses uh, with Shopify and Operation Hope. Uh, black owned businesses. And one of the things he talks about is this idea. I think it comes from the tipping point and uh, or one of Gladwell's books where he talks about that uh, 5% of any population can encourage the other 95% if they have conviction. And I think about this idea of role modeling all the time when it comes to entrepreneurship, that more people that know entrepreneurs that have encountered an entrepreneur at some point in their life, they almost have the audacity or the, they, they feel like they have the permission to kind of try it. And um, we, we, we did this show over the summer called I Quit on, on every channel. It's sort of a Shopify discovery collaboration. And the winner of the show was this guy named Mike D. Um, he's from Durham, North Carolina. He makes this amazing uh, barbecue sauce, Mike D's barbecue sauce. And they didn't actually show this on the show, unfortunately. Um, but off sort of camera, so one of the producers had asked Mike, hey, why did you start this, this business, this, this hot sauce, this, this barbecue sauce company? And he said, well, I love barbecue sauce, but that's, that's not really the reason. The reason is that in my entire life, I never knew an entrepreneur and I never knew a small business owner. Um, I, I just, we, there was no one in our community in Durham, North Carolina that, that had a business uh, like that and that he wanted to do so partially to make money and partially to you know, share his gift with the world but also because he wanted his, his two daughters. He wanted his daughters to see that if they have something that they care about, that they can use entrepreneurship as a vehicle in which to achieve some sort of success or, or to, to, to distribute that to the world and that entrepreneurship is accessible. And as much as we try to make it really easy at Shopify to do so, there still is a barrier to entry if you don't know anyone who's done it, if you don't have a peer group or someone in your family that says, oh, why started the business when I was your age or I did something like that. And so this idea of influencing others to try this, I think, is, is really, really powerful. Yeah, let me actually underscore this um, because I, I don't think this point can be emphasized uh, too much. Holly's exactly right. Like my, my, my grandmother um, ran a printing uh, business um, and um, uh, I, like I, I simply, I grew up um, just having entrepreneurship as a tool in my toolbox, so to speak, right? It just, it's just something that I knew someone who did this and, and they freely talked about it. And um, like, if, if you do the funnel analysis here, like a, a, like a very small group of people can say that they grew up uh, and, and, and had entrepreneurship given to them as one tool, which may end up fitting um, the task at hand. Like I, I ended up like encountering entrepreneurship holes in my, uh, in my life and knew how to, how to fill them. And so um, this is honestly a 
bigger project that needs to be done. I, I think the internet is doing a little bit, like actually a lot right now for this. And I think that this is partly why um, we see just more participation for first not time um, in uh, this century, the number of small business formation is going up again. It's like we finally bent this curve, wow. um, like just now. And so um, that's hugely uh, like impactful. Um, but it just goes to show, like think about just all the opportunities that people just didn't know how to take advantage of, right? It, it, I mean, it, it's tremendously hard to be the best in the world at something. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a very small group of people who can reach this or even attempt for going for it. But the wonderful thing is what you, what you really need to start a uh, like some meaningful income stream um, uh, and, 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 and is, is, is a thousand tr true fans. Um, and that's something you can generate much, much, much easier. Um, and um, what we see is like often people, like if you actually take three different backgrounds together, like three different interests that you just happen to have, um, there might be some product business, there might be um, a Substack um, a newsletter or something that you can create with that. And I think um, that, that that's that's true now, that was just as true 10 years ago. But like, I think the point is that um, when the impulse is there, like you need to be able, like the, the tools need to also do their job. Um, so I'm super fascinated about how uh, big software uh, maybe has hasn't gone in the direction that I would have expected for e-commerce. You know, what I would have imagined would happen with a lot of commerce is that you know the companies with the most money, the biggest companies who can buy the best software, uh, can you know pour the most into uh, into like online channels that they would always be the winners. And that, you know, we would kind of see the big boxification of, of commerce, the way that, you know, Walmart butted out a lot of Main Street, like Main Street businesses, and that we might see that same thing online. And it seemed like that was happening for a little while with Amazon, but now it feels like there's, you know, that the, the rebels have been armed, that the, the tools are there. You know, why hasn't, uh, you know, why has the this sort of new wave of software, you know, permitted people to compete with that the those giants? And you just talk, talk a little bit about that concept of like why software is so important to this and you know what uh, are the ways that smaller businesses are able to actually compete with the biggest businesses in the world uh, when they're equipped with the right software like is it the the human touch element that they can combine with the technology or or what is it that allows them to compete uh, with those big players I mean this is a really really big topic and and you have to get at this from 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 multiple angles I would also suggest that I think we are in the you know, opening paragraphs of chapter two in a very long book on this topic. <laughs> like there's certainly uh, an easy to defend worldview, um, which says that um, there's exactly like, like the internet will eventually converge on a single, like let's say search engine or single social network uh, or, and, and um, potentially single uh, retailer. Um, and certainly there's a lot of scale advantages that come from this, um, uh, but the world doesn't like, change so much based on just um, uh, what, 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 what is sensible. <laughs> In fact, you know, the entire concept of entrepreneurship is, is, is fundamentally not sensible. Like you, you, you're working hundreds of hours um, just so you don't have to work for someone else for 40 hours a week. Um, and um, you, you, <laughs> you make it sound like risk. a raw deal, Toby. <laughs> but, it, but it is, it, I, I, I mean, I, I think, um, and, and, and we are really quite uh, careful um, I think in, in, in all our communications to not over glorify it, because I think that's also wrong. It's um, entrepreneurship is really a means um, like that, that's that, that it's best. It, it's a path best traveled by the people for who it's necessary to travel it. Like there, there's some uh, energy and burning desire to, to, to embark on it because it, it, the, the odds are stacked against you. Um, if you think about just the particular thing that you're building, like is the chance that, this new business you're starting going to succeed, it's, it's, very, it's very low. Um, but it's the chance that you come away better from the experience, better able to do, do the next thing you're doing, that's almost certainly total, right? And, 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 and there in this life of value, we, we are seeing this a lot. I mean, uh, in, in many cases, um, some of our biggest plus customers, uh, you know, just hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, are started uh, like a Shopify store number six by the person. Right, um, uh, who, who ended up founding it. And um, to, to me, that's hugely inspiring. Um, as it comes to the, um, the, the, the Rebel Alliance here, 
Uh, I mean, this is sort of a turn of phrase, and of course, we'll be sort of invoking the Star Wars uh, movies a little, a little bit. Um, um, when we first got the internet, that was the first time you could put something, like could put up a website, and 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 would be able to communicate with a, the people you never met or don't have a phone number for uh, outside of your hometown, which was meaningful because it was in a small town. Um, Shopify is sort of like, let's bring that internet forward. Let's build a business model um, which aligns our interests with that of everyone on the platform and where we can put a lot of things together and and, and, and just say, you know what, because of the marginal cost of software and, and, and so on, like through all these millions of businesses that are succeeding now at, at this scale, we can reinvest all of this money and, and we, we can build the things that will make a meaningful difference again to the success of everyone who's using us. And it creates this virtuous cycle, which is awesome. Um, which is a different virtuous cycle than if your objective would be to try to capture most of the profits of, 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 of a particular market. And I, do, I actually don't know which one of those is going to succeed. Um, I, I hope there's room for both of our approaches. It doesn't actually nest. I don't, I don't actually think about this in terms of winning um, uh, so much uh, because it's not, they can both be true at the same time. Um, but I think it behooves us all to cheer for um, the, the small businesses because you know, something like 80% of all people look for small businesses. Like we, 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 we always like ignore them. Like, I mean, people tend to invoke entrepreneurs and, and SMBs, but sort of in the very abstract, not in the concrete. Concretely, most of the people are employed by them. <laughs> we, we kind of need them for, for the viability of all, all of our economies. So um, I, I, I think it's great when people build business models where they, they open up markets to as many other people to succeed as possible. I think the internet should uh, yield more of that. Yeah. You know, I, I what, what, that. One thing also, one thing also that I think is so important that Tony mentioned is there's also this this idea that to be successful, quote unquote, as an entrepreneur, you have to be uh, the next, you know, Jim Shark or Allbirds. But remember that for so many people, you know, for every 26 seconds, uh, this is a real stat. 26 seconds, a new entrepreneur gets their first sale on Shopify. And for many of those entrepreneurs, their definition of success is also not necessarily being the next Jim Shark, although they may want to be. It may just be putting food on the table. It may just be the ability to not work at that job they absolutely hate. It may be the ability just to put their you know, daughter into ballet lessons or the kids into some sort of sport that they, 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 they otherwise wouldn't be able to afford. And so that is a, as, as a concept, I think it's lost a little bit in the hype of some of these big DTC brands, which are amazing. The other thing that's worthwhile pointing out is Toby talked about the supply side of entrepreneurship, that there are more people starting to say, like, that's a recommendation um, to, to, to people because it probably works slightly less well than presenting the polished, we, we've got everything figured out view. But I, I, I don't think that should be our style. Um, uh, it's sort of be the change you seek is, is, is a rather important sentence to me. And I think there's a direct connection authentic brands and the ones that, that we've seen do, do, do really well, the people behind the brands that just brought themselves. You know, there's a lot of talk, of course, around like things like Kylie Cosmetics or, or Jeffree Star. One of the things that I think uh, that changed in terms of like these celebrities or influencers building real brands on Shopify or, or anywhere for that matter, is that they brought an authenticity that traditionally you hadn't seen before. You'd see, you know, some random, you know, uh, uh, famously Brad Pitt did, had a toothbrush in the 80s that he was endorsing, that there was no connection to it. But the reason that Jeffree Star has built one of the greatest cosmetic brands on the planet is because Jeffree started to makeup tutorials on YouTube and then realized that he actually can go ahead and create his own makeup and he can do, uh, he, he can actually sell those to the audience of people. Everything about the Jeffree Star brand or even the Kylie brand is really authentic. And when you compare that or juxtapose that to something like Sephora, the reason you have a different connection to it is because one provides this sort of perfect, perfect model, um, unapproachable version of, of, of a brand. And say what you want about Kylie, whether or not she had some assistance because of her fame or not, she really did create a brand that is an extension of her. And Jeffrey certainly did the same thing as well. And so I think it's not only important just from a society perspective to have more honesty about who you are and your failures and you know where vulnerability is more of a strength than it is a weakness but actually it's also really really good business uh, to that end you know we talked a little bit about what it's like for a founder trying to go through that like those vulnerability moments and and, and deal with those challenges but 
what do you tell your teammates, especially if somebody, you know, when you're a founder talking to people who aren't the founders, who don't have, you know, as much of the reward to reap if things do succeed, but basically share in a lot of the failure if things don't go so well. Um, how do you, you know, what do you find works for talking to team members? You, know, you guys have run your own businesses now with Shopify, you know, going through its own ups and downs. You know, how can you sort of keep morale high, especially amongst members who don't have, you know, maybe as much uh, like equity in the game, but have plenty of skin. One of the things about Shopify that I, I think people are beginning to understand a little bit, because frankly, we're talking a bit more about it is a vast majority of the people that work at Shopify are founders, entrepreneurs themselves. I, I see people like, you know, Farhan and a bunch of uh, Frankie, and it's just a bunch of people on, on this call right now that work at Shopify. Uh, that are listening to us right now. I mean, so Shopify is, is a collection of people who otherwise would be doing their own, that would be running their own business in many cases very successfully. And we just decided to throw in together because we think we can have a larger impact. So that idea that, um, that we have founders coming to work at Shopify who then treat Shopify as if it's their own company that, that feel this inherent ownership of it, not just with equity, but, 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 but a, a real emotional connection to this idea that, you know, the world is better off with more entrepreneurs and we feel this response responsibility to, to, to create more entrepreneurs and to sort of quote unquote arm these rebels because otherwise the world is all boring and we're all going to be buying from marketplaces and, and department stores all day and that's not interesting. Um, however, once you come to Shopify, one of the things I think that, that is, becomes really apparent is this idea of requalifying every year. And Toby and I talk about this even, even for ourselves, certainly for me, and, and, and Toby says this all the time, that he has to requalify every year to ensure that every year he is still the best candidate to be the CEO of Shopify. And that weight, that onus is, is heavy. But when, you, when you're doing with a group of people who deeply inspire you, who also deeply want to requalify with this incredible growth mindset, unlike any other environment that I've ever encountered, I think you end up with this incredible place where people can stay for a very long time. And, and you know, Josh, you've covered Silicon Valley and technology companies for as long mm -hmm. as I've known you with, with TechCrunch. One of the things that you and I have, have talked about, uh, actually we had a conversation years ago at Whistler, I think at one of the, at some tech conference, you talked about that the, you, you, you felt the average tenure at Shopify uh, was just longer than most other companies. And that's absolutely, that's correct. We, we, we do have people that stay with us for a very, very long time. And, and what that allows a lot of people to do is for them to, to, to keep requalifying, but also to have the, like have 10 years worth of career development uh, every single year. And, and I, you and I think have that if you jump around. I think people come to Shopify for the people, um, uh, but but stay for the mission, right? Like it, it's I, this is one of the most incredible advantages that we uh, that, that that Shopify just has. Like the thing we're doing is really really important. Um, like I, I think this is easier to talk about now than uh, it was because uh, after COVID, because um, uh, it, it just was a little bit more opaque, but. Um, like the, the externalities of Shopify success are more entrepreneurship happening in the world, right? Like it's, it's all kind of so good. Um, and I think that's, that, that's really, really easy to fall in love with. Like, because I mean, certainly like the people, uh, like a lot of people um, at, at Shopify did very, very well and uh, like are not showing up for the paychecks, right? Like they, 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 want, they are interested in working on something that they are going to be incredibly proud of at the end of their career, potentially not just for a particular work, but the downstream effects that the work had. This sort of design a company and its business models with all the external externalities, um, uh, with, with an awareness of all the externalities is something that I think in, in general, most industries don't do well enough. And, and um, uh, so, so, you know, like, again, it is the, like, if you, if you look at just retail, retail is a huge opportunity. <laughs> like it's, it's like what is it, $2 trillion per, uh, digital retail? It's probably gonna be $4 trillion or something. It's like the numbers are, I don't even know how to write so many zeros. I'd get bored and distract before I'm done. <laughs> um, so it's uh, like, this is an enormous opportunity. You, usually when you have a space, then people look at there and it's like, again, they say, cool, um, that is an amazing space. How am I gonna like get most of that? Like that, that's, that's how, that's really what you build a company around in a normal sense. And, and let me just say, like, I think that's an easier company to build. Like it, it's much easier to accrue the benefits of a um, very valuable field to yourself. We are building a business model and a company around 
sharing the opportunity instead, it's, instead of using it for ourselves. I mean, don't get me wrong, Shopify is a very good business, um, uh, especially, especially now to, 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 to the scale of, uh, of, of, of the market itself. But um, that's, that's, that's harder to do. That's, that's a harder thing to do. Like that, that's you're signing up for significantly harder challenges if, 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 if that's the thing you engage that. Um, and so um, that's a bit of a subtle point. Um, and, and, and it usually takes people probably like a year or two looking at Shopify until it somehow clicks that this nourishes like more parts of, 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 of the interests um, than just being surrounded by caring, hardworking, and 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 and, and, and smart and impressive people, um, which is obviously incredible if you can pull it off. Um, but like, uh, so so I think this is why tenure is high. This is why care is high. This is why, um, like, I but, but I think but I think there's a lot of aliveness. And uh, and and again, when we get to work with incredible uh, merchants, incredible entrepreneurs, again, such an like incredibly inspiring people like really every direction you look and that's 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 an amazing situation so you talked a little bit earlier about like making people feel like they're founders like that they're part owners in a business regardless of sort of the equity stake and so i wanted to ask you know how how do you um how do you, how do you uh, sort of deputize people to be leadership? Because I think you, know, you guys have done an incredible job of building this sort of wider bench. It's not just you, Toby, it's Harley and the rest of the co-founding team uh, that feel like they're the, the leaders of Shopify. It's not like a single point of failure. And I think that that's so important for a lot of brands because there's so many challenges, so many things you have to tackle, especially if you're running your own shop, like you're, you're juggling a million things, but it can be natural to sort of like hoard power and control over something because it's it's your baby. You don't want to give up and you don't want somebody else to suddenly make a decision that could move it in the wrong direction. But by not giving up any of that power, by like wrestling, you know, keeping an iron grip on everything, you're just letting actually a lot slip through your fingers. And so how have you thought about, uh, Toby, like you know, deputizing other figures in the business to feel like they're part owners? And, you know, how would you, what would you say for advice for, you know, e-commerce leaders out there who maybe are like a sole founder or CEO to help make sure that there are other people in their business that they can, that they trust that they can rely on and that they're you know open to uh delegating some of that power and responsibility to so that they can be a stronger team together i th i mean this is probably the hardest question to answer in the entire world of business i i i actually don't think there is a formula to do it and i i, I also wouldn't say that i have a particular line on the truth on this particular matter um um, I, whenever I'm thinking about my failures, it's usually the failures around um, doing this uh, as uh, better. Um, <clears throat> I guess, I, guess um, I have a very strong sense that um, real progress comes from uh, just alignment. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm, I should, I'm losing my voice right now. Um, I guess the point, uh, what, what you want to do is again, after, you know, if you can pull it off that people fall in, the, in, in love with the same problem and the same mission, um, then um, what you need is context. Like I, I get, there, there's a couple of things we talk very casually around Shopify about. Um, Chesterton's fence is a mental model um, that um, uh, is worth reading up on, right? Because, you know, we build this company and, um, uh, you know, we build it in a hurry sometimes. And so some of the parts we built were just put up in a hurry because you need to put up something and some parts you very, very carefully considered. And, um, you know, when especially new leaders come along, it's, it's very important for them to understand um, which walls of the building they can take the sledgehammer to and um, uh, then uh, um, which, which parts uh, they, they, they need to be care careful about, right? And so anyway, the, the point is, um, there's a broader mission, and that's quite clear. There's a there's a there's a role un, uh, underneath this about like an area, and that needs to be clear. And this is the way I think everyone wants to know how can I make my work best to the benefit of the of of of, of the collective. And um, as long as you spend the time with everyone to to just explain, here's like the direction. Here's the, looking at the plans, like make sure like like agree that this is the right way. I mean, you build the trust battery, and once the, once the battery is fully charged, you don't need to do that anymore. 
And, and I think this is where so much of uh, uh, the potential speed in companies like this comes from. We talk a lot about the, the trust, the trust battery. It's, it's, it's an interesting analogy because, or a metaphor to use, because what, what tends to happen is most people come into the company and they're, you know, we're at 50% trust battery when you come in and the more you deliver on time, you do what you say, you, 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 you do the things that, that you, you said you would do, trust battery goes up. And once you get to that point where there is really high trust, whether it's hundred percent or ninety nine percent somewhere in that range, you, you get autonomy. And that's where actually everything you, 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 you loved about being a founder of your own thing, you can actually do at Shopify as well. And the reverse is true, of course, too. You know, by, by, doing, by not doing what, you're, what you say you're going to do, by, by failing to, to live up to uh, your, your, your expectations and, and, and what you've committed to, eventually the battery does get to a point where it may not be able to be recharged like an old cell phone battery. And, and, and at that point, it just, you know, that, that's when it's better to sort of part ways. But remember, one of the things that is so unique about Shopify, and, and, and many of you uh, that are listening, now it, it's the same in your own business too it is amazing to do very something very challenging something very difficult with people you deeply respect and that is amazing and that's a lot of people have that with their with their jobs but the added benefit to the mission of shopify is that um we think that what we're doing the, the actual mission of the company helping more people d uh discover and 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 get deep into entrepreneurship that connects like the Venn diagram of a lot of our personal interests and the company's mission, there is massive overlap. And it's not to say that other technology companies don't have that, but you know, if, if I was selling, I don't know, accounting software, it'd be cool, but I, I wouldn't feel like, wait a second, we are actually arming the rebels. We are creating an entire, uh, you know, um, an entire mission around this idea that anyone can go ahead and create financial independence. Anyone can, can, can find their own identity and, and share it with the world. That also is a very valuable thing to have the thing you are working on and the thing you personally care about uh, to have so much overlap on those on those on those two items. Yeah, I, I love that phrase of the idea that uh, that you know how um, just that that sense of like charging the battery and getting yourself to autonomy, but also the concept of like get people to fall in love with the same problem as you. I think that alignment is so important, and it reminds me of this quote uh, that Jeff Marks told me. Jeff Marks is one of the uh, the writers of Avenue Q uh, and uh, the Book of Mormon, the incredibly popular musicals. And when he was working with his partner, he said that they would frequently come to a point where they would disagree about like how a scene should go or the lyrics to a song, and the 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 easy decision. To to do was like to say, well, uh, you know, Jeff says it should be this way and his partner says it should be this way. And so the only options are it's either his way his, the other guy's way, or it's a compromise in the middle. And Jeff told me what I thought was one of the most insightful things that when he'd ever told me was that there is a secret missing fourth option. And that's where you say, if it's not aligned with both of us, it's not good enough. And you just go back to the drawing board and write a whole new scene, a whole new song that you both are so in love with that you're both going to promote it with your full, like your, your full heart and energy. Because if you cr start to uh, divert from that alignment, if you start to have little pieces of a bigger project where you say like, ah, oh, well, that wasn't my decision. And you can kind of like opt out of the responsibility and accountability for them. You quickly opt out of accountability for the entire project and you don't put your heart behind actually making it a success. And I think like that, that concept of how you come to uh, alignment with your partner is so important. And tell me, maybe you could tell us like, have you guys had a decision maybe between you and Hartley where you guys have come to that sort of like butting heads about which direction should go to, uh, which you should go in and how did you guys resolve that decision and find that path forward where everyone was aligned. By the way, Josh, I think I think um, I, I, I hope everyone realized this, this was the soundbite that everyone should have tuned in for because this is <laughs> ridiculously good advice that you that, that, that you just shared. It, it absolutely echoes everything I, I, I've seen in my career. Um, I would actually put in uh, like if I had more time, I would probably put an impassioned um, plea for also taking the compromise option off the table um, because um, that is like most of the products in the world are like extremely mediocre, right? Um, the, 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 the reason is um, everyone end, end, ending up settling for hybrid solutions um, that end up being compromises and, and, and compromises by the way, just importantly, um, will never end up with real strengths because the thing that people disagree about is usually the edginess of something. So like a compromise always like 
like never resembles the spikiness of, 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 of a really nifty idea. It always ends up resembling some kind of river stone that got ground up over time and is now like perfectly agreeable. Um, so um, you really like do it one way, the other way, or generate new options. Um, and I think that's a sentence we have a lot. Like we get in a lot of meetings and there's disagreement. We just say, hey, I could, that's find new options. Like maybe we don't need to make a decision within the confines of a like of this, uh, like the boundaries in the, um, which we fought to uh, make a choice in. Maybe if we step one step out of this particular box and play with boundaries a bit, we can actually circumnavigate the entire thing, right? Like, um, um, you know, that's like Shopify ship with, what is it, supporting, I, I mean, initially like 10 payment gateways and, and, and then, um, like I think we went up to 80. At some point we realized we should just ship the payments. Like no one can, like websites should just be able to accept money. And then and, and that's how we did it. And hopefully we'll be able to deliver something around like this for the world of shipping again. Like if you step out of the confines in which you're trying to make a choice, you often see a better play, right? And that's important. I, I, I mean, I, I can, nothing terribly, good example of this other than just, I can I can confirm that Hadi and I have plenty of disagreements. And um, it, it, I, I mean, we've never taken something to the vote, have we? Like, I, I, it's it's more like I mean, at some point, just the, like there's an overwhelming obviousness to, 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 to some approach or, or, or one way to go. And then we go with that. Yeah, but it seems like you got, you weren't able to convince him to take a profile picture with a better hat. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty. I think that's. Awesome. I like my. I like my. Yeah. Actually, you know, Toby's Toby, as you know, is a famous hat wearer. So I, I felt that I had to step it up a little bit. Um, but it's uh, <laughs> you know one one of the things also, Josh, I, I think that is is uh, interesting on on that point as well is uh, this idea that um, the the idea of compromise, for example, like the Toby Toby's example of Shopify. We had this thing called Active Merchant, which was our open source pin gateway library, which had again, like, I think it was actually 95 payment gateways we had. And then this idea that adding another five payment gateways is probably the local maxima version of, of, of what we should be doing. But actually, what if payments just came stock inside of Shopify? That is a conversation that we constantly think of. How do we actually like for, forget what the next step is in this on this particular amount? If you sort of zoom out and say, what are entrepreneurs need? What does small business need? They don't need to wait forty eight hours to get a merchant account approved or provision a merchant account. They don't need to send their passport, uh, you know, fax their passport to some bank in Utah. What they need is they need to be able to accept payments right away. And more and more, I think what what, what we're trying to do is, is that just to continue to reduce the, any barrier to uh, to success that that, that exists and. Is something that came up earlier, which we sort of jumped over quickly, is um, right now, if you were to think about Shopify uh, as a retailer, we're not a retailer, of course, but if you were to pretend for a second that Shopify was a single retailer, we would be the second largest online retailer in America. Uh, Amazon's checkout is the, would be the largest, the second would be Shopify's. That's ing pretty incredible uh, how, how far this has come so quickly. Um, so yeah. I want to ask an, another question, which is a little bit more forward facing. And we talked a lot about the vulnerability of entrepreneurs uh, and you know some incredible insights so far. You, know, you guys talked about uh, the, you know, it's hard to build an e-commerce brand, but the cost of failure is about as close to zero as we've ever been. Um, and that people are looking for this alternative career path that, you know, the, the, that this is the moment that Shopify was created for and that, you know, that as many people should be able to participate in the internet as possible. Uh, that you want to make your own game and that, you know, especially when you have role models of people who've shown you what you can do with entrepreneurship in your life, you realize how malleable the world really is. You know, getting to those first 1000 true fans matters more than like massive distribution. Um, and that right now there's, this is the moment because small business formation is growing for the first time in a century. Uh, and, you know, I really love you guys talk about that entrepreneurship is working a hundred hours for yourself. So you don't have to work 40 hours for somebody else. And that sometimes it make you know, failing makes you better at winning and you you talked about how some of the Shopify's biggest sellers actually had five failed shops first before they find the one that really worked. And that, you know, even though entrepreneurship is really hard and we should never glorify it, that, uh, you know, if you can get people aligned with the dream and the problem that you're trying to solve, you know, they're going to feel that sense of autonomy uh, uh, and you're going to be able to trust them enough to do, uh, to, you know, sort of act as your second hand. And, and that's when you, you can really start to get a lot more done. Um, and I, I do hope, and like Toby said, that we, that the planet Earth starts to get a little bit 
bit more tired of fakeness uh, and you know, that you need to really be able to charge your battery with trust and do what you say so that people are willing to give you that, uh, that, um, that autonomy and that compromise can lead to mediocrity. That, that, that quote you said, Toby, of like a compromise is a river stone ground down over time to something perfectly agreeable, you know, has no teeth anymore. It's like, you're never going to be able to sink in to a market or really like connect to somebody if there's no edge to it. But with all, with, those are some of the amazing points that you guys shared so far. But so before we finish up, I want to ask, what are some trends or opportunities that you see for e-commerce entrepreneurs out there or any entrepreneur to seize on? Maybe that's new platforms that they should be jumping on, you know, new forms of experimentation, uh, you know, being, you know, we talked a little bit about being more vulnerable in public uh, or just writing in public um, or, you know, being more forceful about talking to your community and your network about getting, you know, having them help you uh, get off the ground. You know, what, maybe do you have any of those little pieces of advice about how to adapt to the future of e-commerce and entrepreneurship? I think one thing that uh, that <laughs> most people assume about Toby and I because of the Shopify connection, of course, is that we think that the future of retail or commerce is, is online only. And actually, we don't think that. We actually think the future of retail, the future of commerce is, is everywhere. It's wherever consumers want to buy. And one of the reasons you're seeing us talk, you know, announce things with, with TikTok or with Walmart or with Instagram is that we think that the, the, the modern day town squares are online and they're offline and they're, they're actual town squares, but they're also in places like Clubhouse. And so part of what we're trying to accomplish is that when you come to Shopify, maybe you just want to sell initially online, but very quickly you may want to activate a physical online, a physical channel, or you want to sell on some other marketplace, or you want to sell across social media. The idea should be that, uh, that you as, as, as an entrepreneur, as a merchant, need to sell wherever your consumers are. And, and, and I think activating new channels, I was, I, did a, I was in a clubhouse room a couple weeks ago and was just doing a Q&A about um, entrepreneurship and someone basically just pitched me their company, it was a tea company, and, and, and she's like, hey, just come, this is, this is not a question, this is just a pitch. And actually I started buying tea from this person's company. She now has a way that, if she has a way to, to engage a community in a place like Clubhouse where most other tea companies are not even thinking about, uh, that is amazing. And so I, I don't actually think that there is one way to do this. I think that uh, there is anyone that, 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 that's on here right now that is thinking about starting a business. First of all, figure out what you, what you already do, what, what you already love, a gift that you already have. Um, if you write a blog about soccer, maybe you should start selling soccer products to those people that are already engaged with you around, around that concept. But this idea that you know, it's, it's so precious and you have to create a business plan, I think that is ridiculous. I actually think that it is, it is the best time ever. Again, it's not easy and it certainly is not, uh, it, it certainly is not gonna happen automatically to be successful, but there is no better time for, for, for entrepreneurship than, than right now because of the tools and the access to a global consumer base. And, and I, I just wanna also say for those that are on the consumer side, for everyone listening, if you want more of these brands to exist, and I, I certainly do, we need to make sure that we buy from these independent brands. On the other side of this pandemic, if we want our communities and our cities to be interesting and to have character and have culture, we need to make sure these businesses exist. And so when you buy from these independent brands and these merchants, and these entrepreneurs, you are actually voting that they need to exist in the world. And so this is just a call out to everyone listening, please like, support independent business, support local um, shops and, 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 and merchants. This is so important. Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question question, but I, I couldn't miss the opportunity to uh, give a shout out to, uh, to all the entrepreneurs. And I, I can't add anything to that. I, I think um, uh, uh, you close the loop perfectly here. It, it's um, again, there's, there's, you know, Shopify has many things uh, right, right now it's growing a lot, but like it, it, it fundamentally represents a worldview that um, it's super important to enable uh, uh, people reaching for independence. Um, retail is only one um, area of that, um, which is the one we focus on. Other companies are also in this arena uh, and we cheer for them as well. And um, um, I, I, I think that's the, that's honestly the key thing that explains um, uh, the, 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 the company the best and we'll try to make it simpler and simpler and simpler um, to, to build these businesses and um, Maybe one plug is uh, there's going to be a Cambrian explosion of new channels coming uh, that, that are going to help people uh, find product market fit. Um, uh, that that um, it's going to be really really exciting. I mean, obviously, uh, live selling is some is somehow going to make it to the West uh, in the next couple of years, and 
um, a lot of things like this. But just the website is so overlooked. It, like we will never, like, I, I think this is sort of an interesting time right now because I, uh, you know, everyone, well, not everyone, but I, I certainly, and maybe some others are tracking um, the conversations around Apple and, um, you know, what they allow in the stores and, um, uh, you know, uh, what, what they charge for and how much and so on. Um, like a lot of this conversation is really, really good, um, but just remember the web browser could never be created now. Like the, the web browser is one of the most important things that I think has been created. Uh, it's one of the most complex pieces of software that has ever been made. It's one of the most amazing pieces of software that's ever been made. And it's the one place that can give you some, like where you can uh, stake out territory for yourself. Um, it's it's play, the one place on the web that you can own. Uh, sorry, the one place on the internet that you can own. Almost every other place where anyone can reach you is going to be rented. Now that's not a bad thing and often it's super worth it, um, but you can own your website. You you can represent your brand with no middlemen and um, you can do, um, you can really tell your story. So make use of it. Um, it's also going to outlast probably every other channel because it's, it's very, very hard to imagine that the web would go fully away. Um, so it's worth the investment and uh, I just sort of shout out to my 90s internet sensibilities. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, those are almost, it, it, it almost might sound contradictory. That it's like, oh, you want to be on these new platforms, places where everybody are, isn't because you're going to be able to take advantage of when you join Clubhouse right now. It might seem like you, if you join today to Clubhouse, you might seem like you're late, but you're really so early still. Yeah. Uh, and on these new platforms, people are so much more generous with their follows, generous with their time versus these mature networks. Uh, but that said, on any social app, you are always kind of renting the space and you know someone can always change your algorithmic distribution uh, or you know what your what notifications you can send and so building on you know a property which is totally unintermediated like the web is just such, you know, such an important uh, philosophy I think you guys have done a great job of keeping the the web something that's so important in commerce and it not sort of all having to get buried inside of apps uh, where there's you know fees and other types of control so I'm really thankful for you guys for that thanks so much Josh this yes is this is fun this has been this amazing fun. I would I would love to do this with you guys again if you're interested. It would be amazing to have you again on, Toby. Uh, and if you guys do want to hear more from Harley, we're actually doing a talk, me and him, just a one-on-one -on, -one on Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific uh, to just talk about the sort of his his upbringing, his story of going from a t-shirt seller to president of Shopify, and you know what you what other people can learn about that journey through entrepreneurship. If you guys want to subscribe to that, if you just tap my little glowing face, either follow me or just hit uh, the little press club button at the bottom. That's my club and the show that I run. Uh, and that's where we're going to have Harley on on Friday. And we would love to have you uh, as listeners for that. But otherwise, I hope that we get to do more of these because, you know, there's a lot of sort of very casual talks on, on, on Clubhouse. There's a lot of really, you know, fun ones. But, you know, getting vulnerable and getting serious and talking about some of the real challenges that entrepreneurs face and that it's not all, you know, three comma clubs and big fundraises and, you know, and announcements in TechCrunch uh, that it's oftentimes five failures before you succeed. Or uh, as you guys said, you know, that, the, the successful discovery of things that did not work. And so, you know, uh, I'll leave it with, with Toby's quote from before, you know, that we are in you know, maybe the, the opening paragraphs of chapter two of a very long book on the topic of commerce. And so it is never too late to get started. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us, everyone here in the audience. Thank you for helping us break clubhouse. I guess that's the phrase now. It means a ton to me. And I think it means a ton to these guys to get to share, you know, a more vulnerable message than you might hear on your very professional and honestly you know, very exciting earnings calls. <laughs> so thank you guys for uh, for joining us today. Thanks, Josh. This is great. Thanks everyone for joining. It means a lot if to you, us. If you guys want some of the Thanks quotes everyone. from this talk, I'm, uh, I'm sharing them on my Twitter. It's linked through my, my clubhouse. Uh, Toby and Harley have dropped some, just a ridiculous list of gems. And I've been taking notes this whole time. So if you want some of those, I've got a few of them up on my Twitter right now. Uh, but otherwise, I will play you guys out with an appropriate jam. And otherwise, see you, Harley, for, uh, for our one-on-one -on -one Friday 1 p.m. with Press Club. And I'm also running a talk tomorrow night with Justin Kahn, uh, co-founder of Twitch, uh, and a bunch of the top journalists like Mike 
Isaac from the New York Times uh, about the launch of uh, Twitter Spaces, the new Clubhouse competitor, Facebook building their own Clubhouse competitor. So if you want to hear the great Clubhouse debate about what's going to happen with Clubhouse versus the big social platforms, uh, join us tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Pacific on Press Club. But otherwise, just deeply thankful for you guys to get so real and so vulnerable. And the you know the sort of uh, the uh, the amour between you two, the, the the fact that you guys have both, like you said, fall in love with the same dream, I think is truly inspiring. So thanks again for coming on and thanks to everybody out there in the audience.